Joining us now to talk a little bit about behavioral health, Dr. Ava Boswell is back with us from San Juan Health Partners Behavioral Health. Dr. Boswell, good morning. Thank you for calling in today. Thank you so much for having me. I greatly appreciate it. You bet. It's great to have you back on the program, and uh, we wanted to bring you back to talk a little bit about behavioral health in the community. Of course, you know, I know uh, students and parents are dealing with this virtual learning, and I know a lot of students would rather be back in the classroom face-to-face with their teachers. Uh, Do you have any advice for maybe students on how to deal with that and parents on how to help their students deal with that? So one of the things that I've I've seen the most that's happening um, with the kids that I'm treating is that kids function really well on schedules, and parents do too, actually. Everybody does. But what virtual learning has done is it's kind of taken the schedule away because a lot of kids don't have to get up at the same time. They don't have to go to bed at the same time um, because they don't have you know, they're getting up to go to their living room or to the kitchen table to do school instead of getting up and getting dressed and getting in the car to then go to school and see their friends and have the social engagement. And so what's happening is that um, the kids are, they don't have the same social engagement. They don't have the same schedule and they are getting more depressed and um, more anxious Um and sitting in front of the, the screen for a, a longer period of time than they would if they were in class is also really taxing. And so what I've been suggesting to a lot of my parents um, is that keep your kids on a schedule. Um, have them get up at the same time they would, you know, when they normally would get up to go to, you know, in-person school. Um, have them get up and get dressed. Eat breakfast. Then you know, get yourself on a daily routine with whatever classes they have and the homework so that they stay in that routine so that when they do go back in person that you don't have to kind of like recreate the wheel. And the schedule actually helps keep them on track with their assignments so they don't fall behind. And it keeps them in a routine so that they um, they just have better time management skills because in some cases, um, kids are actually attending their classes like in their pajamas from their bed um, and then getting more and more depressed and, you know, then having to seek care, um, which is it's a, it's a kind of a vicious cycle. So keeping keeping the schedule going and is, is the best option that I have, um, you know, my best recommendation for parents. That makes a lot of sense. And I know for some students, of course, they are going to school face to face some days a week and then being at home other days of the week. So that sounds like that would work really well in those situations to just stay on the same schedule, whether you're catching the bus or just turning on the computer. That is very definitely true. If, if you know, you have a schedule on Monday and Tuesday where you go to school, if you can do the same schedule Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the days that you're off. It will make going back the next week much easier, and you won't fall behind in your studies and the lectures and the homework, um, which is happening. And, you know, we want our kids to succeed, and so keeping them on that schedule is really important. Great. And uh, I want to ask about, well, it's a two-part question. One is we are dealing with a time of indefinite uncertainty, I would say, and which is somewhat of what you're speaking to about these schedules and such. But what about these other um, basic exercises, maybe like deep breathing, some some type of walk, some types of t- uh, like tactile things? What is your advice on that front? Um, for the first question, the indefinite uncertainty, um, this is it's a really hard topic, um, and it kind of leads into the second uh, second part of it. Um, indefinite uncertainty leads to increased anxiety. It leads to increased distress and depression. Some people it leads to insomnia, and so all of those are risk factors for um, depression, anxiety, having to seek treatment, and some people even to the point of having suicidal thoughts things like that. Um, So the indefinite uncertainty, I recommend to my patients who are very anxious and and becoming depressed in this situation is that they really have to find the ground to themselves to where they are. And you can't control tomorrow or the next day, but you, what you do have is right now. And so really focus on what you have right now. Be thankful for that. Some of the techniques are, you know, taking deep breaths, 
And there's what's called four by four breathing, where you breathe in for four seconds, you hold for four seconds, you breathe out for four seconds, and then you do a cycle of four breaths. And basically that helps reset your nervous system. And if you have to do it more than once, you know, do. The other thing is taking space for yourself. And what, what I mean by that is literally physically taking space. If you're having anxiety, if you're in a, um, a situation that, you know, might be more stressful than normal where you may get irritable, separating yourself from the stimulus that's causing the issues, stepping away from it, and even taking just five minutes um, outside, five minutes in the bedroom, five minutes um, in the kitchen where you're not um, around whatever is triggering you is a really good way of kind of resetting things and then being able to come back with like a really calm mind and calm presence to whatever the situation is. And especially in dealing with kids who are upset about schoolwork, as a parent, taking that five minutes away can really change the interaction with the child or with the kids. Um, Other things are really focusing on self-care. And what I mean by that is exercise, eating right, um, getting good sleep, staying on a good sleep schedule, and also engaging in the activities that you enjoyed previously. Because a lot of times, especially during this very definite time of uncertainty, we have a tendency to distance ourselves from the things that we used to love. A lot of people, for example, loved sports and getting back into like physical activity and sports is harder with like the social distancing requirements. But at the same time, being able to find some kind of an activity, a sport that maybe you do, um, maybe it's tennis instead of playing basketball so that there's more distance. Um, Maybe it's running instead of playing football. So something that, you know, you are getting out, you are getting exercise and you're getting sunlight. Those things are very important for self-care. Good point, Dr. Boswell. And I wanted to ask you one more question about students and that and parents. And that would be, um, you know, for maybe students who have been, you know, honor roll students, 4.0 students in their face-to-face classes, and now they're on the computer and their grades are just crashing and parents are concerned and students are stressed and, and parents want to help, but they don't know how to help. Is there any advice that you may have for that type of, of situation that could be so very different from what that family is used to? Um, digital learning and online learning is so much different. It's a different format than um, in-person learning. So that that has caused significant problems in kids who have succeeded in the classroom. And there's a learning curve to learning how to learn in a digital format. And so number one is being really patient um, as a parent. Number two is really finding out where the struggle is and looking at it um, in depth and saying, why is my child struggling with distance learning? Is it that they don't focus well on the screen? Is it that there's more distractions at home? Is it that the workload is higher? Is it that they don't understand the material? And really try to dissect out what the issue is that's causing them problems. And for a lot of parents and, and especially some, some people who are, um, have just graduated from high school who are going into college, I found that this is a pretty significant issue because they've done really well in high school, you know, ex- excelled and then end up in college and they've been into, you know, online learning and they're really, really struggling. And so, um, in that situation, I've, I've suggested, you know, breaking it down into what is different about this. And, you know, a lot of it is maintaining focus for a longer period of time, not being able to get up and move like you would in a classroom, you know, um, that you're, you've got the sustained attention on a screen for like 40 to 60 minutes, which is actually really hard when our attention span isn't that long. And, you know, we're not using pen and paper and, and books in the same way. And it's a lot of it is PowerPoint and people don't retain the information as well from PowerPoint. So it's figuring out how to translate the information into a format that you can study and work with. 
Um, but breaking down the learning steps is really important and understanding where your child is having problems. Very good. Thank you. Great. And uh, so I have, we have one last question here, which is related to the suicide problem. And uh, I know this is pretty complex and there's a lot of gradations and stuff, but when, when it comes to suicidal ideation and plans and such like that, um, when is it outpatient seek immediately versus crisis center emergency room? Okay. So the first step is really identifying what step the person's at. Are they, are they depressed? Are they anxious? Are they distressed? And how severe that is. Um, then asking the questions, which are difficult questions of is, where are they in this cycle? Is it that they're just feeling very hopeless and helpless or have they moved from the hopeless, helpless stage to thinking and contemplating suicide or having passive thoughts of that I, it, the world would be better if I just wasn't here or has it moved from that thinking to this is what I would do to hurt myself or to the next step, which is much more critical of this is what I'm going to do and this is how I'm planning. And then the next step from there is that they're collecting whatever, whatever method they would do to harm themselves. So it's really identifying where they are in the process. If a person is having depression, anxiety, like step one um, would be a time to seek outpatient help um, because they have not, that person hasn't gone through the other steps. If you get um, to the point where someone is, has a thoughts about harming themselves and what they would do to harm themselves, that becomes like a gray area of they could be treated outpatient if, um, if they had close outpatient follow-up and close family support. If it becomes to a point where the person has active thoughts that they are going to hurt themselves multiple times a day and they have a plan, there's no question they need to come into the hospital. So that is where if there's any question at all, they really need, the person really needs to be evaluated um, by um, either a psychiatrist or a mental health professional, an ED physician, urgently. And so I, I always suggest that if there's any question at all, it's better in these situations to be safe than it is to be sorry. And that's why these services exist. Absolutely. Very helpful. Thank you so much. And thank you for coming on to our show, Dr. Boswell. We really appreciate oh, you've no given problem. us a lot of uh, helpful advice. Um, I do want to stress that at any time there is a suicide hotline, it's 1-800-273-TALK, and that's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it is, it's for anyone who's having thoughts, concerns, um, and they can definitely help you get in, get into services. There's also our San Juan Behavioral Health, which is 505 609 Six six eight zero to get into care, and then no question, San Juan Behavioral Health um, and the ED work together really well. So you know, if you have any questions, come on into the emergency room. And thank you so much for the time; I greatly appreciate it. Thank you.